Good afternoon. Whoa, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you had a delicious lunch. It is such a beautiful day outside. I almost think we should go outside and do the afternoon session out in the parking lot, which would be fantastic. This afternoon, we are going to get right into the speaking. So uh, you have the treat of having two speakers this afternoon. The first is Gordon Harris, and the second is uh, Sarah Jackson. So I am here first to introduce Gordon Harris to you, you know, I have the the advantage that he is my husband. So, you know, uh, come on, come on up here while I while I introduce you. We have been married for many years now. It's quite miraculous, isn't it? Do you know when Gordon um, when Gordon and I first met, we were in university, and uh, I was not a Christian. He was kind of like one of these Christians. So if you know people like that, there's hope, and sometimes it takes time. But I remember he said to me, um, you know, he said. Uh, I don't think you're the one for me. Now, I wasn't a Christian. I was like, what? You know, how, how could that be that I couldn't be the one for you? And, he, and I said, do you think marriages are made in heaven? And he's like, yeah, I kind of think they do. I was like, I have no clue what this guy is talking about. But fast forward, I met Jesus. And now we have this marriage that's most of the time pretty heavenly. <laughs> So, um, he is going to be your speaker today. I want to also advertise, because I'm not um, biased in any way, that he has written this book that is beautiful. I, say, I mentioned yesterday how he has immersed himself really into the book of Genesis, and, and his professors at university um, said he was like the Protestant Henry Nouwen. Does anybody love Henry Nouwen? It's beautiful. You couldn't get a better compliment than that. So that, that is a, I would say it's the kind of book that's narrative. He's talking and then he shoots in some theology, narrative and theology. So I think you would love it. I actually felt like we should pray for people in here who want to write a book. Anybody in here, if you want to write a book, stand up. If you've had it prophesied over you, if you know you have something in there, and I want to, I want to say to you, writing a book can be torturous. Has anybody started or tried? But when the Lord moves on that book, this guy primarily wrote the book in a month, and he had taken years before that, kind of in in that writer's cramp. Is that what you would call it? Um, and so I believe when it's the right time and when the, the Lord moves, and let's pray. Let's both of us pray. So, Father, look around this room. There are tons of book writers in here, Father, people that you have put a deep message inside of them to write and communicate and to literally plant your kingdom on earth through the word. And I ask that today you remove all the brain noise and all the heart noise and all the questions of, can I do it? Can I not? What if somebody rejects me? What if it's not acceptable? And I ask that you clear all that away. And Lord, I ask that you will fast forward the learning process of how to do this. Will you fast forward, you just give them uh, an injection of uh, uh, literary speed, Lord. <laughs> Let it go from zero to a hundred. And Lord, I ask that you connect all the dots that need to be connected in order for your message to come through them in an excellent way, Lord that not only teaches but moves people to the next level. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. That is beautiful. I can't wait to see those books. Love, have a good time. Thanks, babe. Uh, I have to tell you that uh, the process was interesting. We, uh, there was one Saturday morning where I was having a, uh, one of my periodic angst moments and I came into the bedroom, and uh, Kathy's in the bed. I'd gotten up at 6 to write or something, and I said, Oh, babe, I just, I'm just not, I'm not getting anything done, and it's just not happening, and, you know, oh, I just feel terrible. Time is ticking away, and, and she, um, you know, she's lived with this for a while, you know, so I think she was a bit thinking about, you know, okay, this is not really working well. So she said, well, just don't write it. And I said, what? What? Yeah, just don't write it. It's not worth all this internal angst, babe. And, 
And of course, she's my, you know, she's my biggest fan. She's the one who helps me, you know, move beyond myself. And, and I'm thinking, what? Yeah, it's just not worth it. And then inside, I was like, I didn't say this out loud. I'm like, oh, yeah? Watch this. <laughs> not my finest moment ever, but... Um, uh, God over, overrode all of those kinds of things, and out it came. And uh, my, my parents-in-law, uh, they're, you know, they're downsizing, and uh, so they're, they're big readers, and so their bookshelf has gone from multiple shelves down to one shelf of about this many books. And I was gratified to see last week, weekend that my book is on there. Yeah. I, I think it's probably because they, you know, they knew I was coming to visit, so... I didn't want to you know, look bad, so uh, I'm really excited about uh, what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about transformation this afternoon. Uh, this is a big deal for us in the school. Our, our tagline uh, that we've had for a number of years is encounter God, be transformed, change the world. In case Kathy didn't say it, we are the directors of the School of Ministry. How many of you have benefited from the ministry of the students this weekend? <laughs> That's great, isn't it? They are on fire. It's fabulous. Uh, so, you know, transformation is a big deal. And I asked uh, my permanent team a few weeks ago, what's the thing that keeps you running in this place, keeps you happy and encouraged to keep doing what you're doing here? Because some of us have been doing it for quite a while. And almost invariably, they said transformation. Uh, we, we love when people come to our three-week leader schools and they are hungry and God meets them and they go away changed. And, uh, you know, the majority of time we spend with the five-month school, so they're, you know, 18 to 35. And to see these uh, young uh, adults come one way and just sprout into this, these, uh, these people that God intended for them to be is miraculous. So... You've experienced some of it. Uh, Jonatus was up here speaking the other day, and I'm like, wow, how did that ever happen? You know, when he came, he didn't even really know English. And, uh, and there he is, and his wife, Mel, I mean, she, you know, when, when we got her in the school, she just kind of had her head down. And now this beautiful, confident young woman, and we see this kind of thing all the time. It's, God does amazing work. So... We love transformation. By transformation, I mean that deep change in a person's thinking, in how they feel, and how they relate. And uh, I think, how many of you would like some transformation? Yeah, we all want that, don't we? I was reading earlier this year Eric Metaxas' book on Martin Luther, and uh, it, was, it was fascinating. I have not read much about Luther for many years, and so it was good to kind of come back and refresh and learn some new things. And of course, we all owe a great debt of gratitude to Luther, don't we? You know, we, we, you know him, he and the other reformers, they help us have this thing, really. And it's actually bigger than that. Uh, but amazing, we owe this debt to him. In his day, uh, there was a, a man named Erasmus, and he was a Dutch scholar, philosopher. Uh, he lived in Rotterdam. And he and Luther initially had many of the same uh, objections to what was happening in the church. So their theology uh, was on the same line pretty much. Their objections were on the same line. But there was a vast difference between them. As time went on, Luther, and, and I think the pressure on him and his personality together, uh, he, he had to get more black and white, uh, he, he, be, he began to be a, a little bit more belligerent in how he said things. With Luther, you were in or out. There was no kind of, why don't you come and be with us? It'll be good. You know, as, as Danny would say, he was a man of war. That's what he became. And he was fighting a war uh, for his very existence, literally, and what he believed. Erasmus was saying some of the same things, but somehow he was able to sort of dance around and not get himself into trouble, which was quite a skill, I think. But eventually the time came when Erasmus could no longer dance around, and he found himself in this unenviable position of having to make a decision. Am I going to go and be part of this widespread Reformation movement, this evangelical movement, or am I going to remain with the Catholic Church and try to make change within? 
And unfortunately for him, Luther uh, was highly critical of him, which is a bit of a bummer. And he said some very unkind things about him. And on the other hand, uh, uh, the church was pressing Erasmus to make a stand because Erasmus was a bright guy and a lot of people listened to him. So he was being pressed on both sides. And finally, he made his decision. And it's interesting, if you read a number of uh, things that he's written, he has, one of the, he has many complaints, great critiques actually. But this one quote, and I've cleaned it up a little bit to make it easier to understand, uh, but he, he says this in one letter. And he's speaking not necessarily to Luther, but to uh, the Re Reformation leaders as a whole. You speak bitterly against the luxury of priests, the ambition of bishops, and the tyranny of the Pope, and the babbling of the sophists. You speak against our prayers, our fasts, our masses, and you're not content to cut down on the abuses that may be in these things, but you must abolish them entirely. Nothing, in short, that is generally received pleases you. So in other words, you, know, you, you could have just tried to fix the stuff, but instead you wiped it all out and said it's all garbage. And then he goes on. In the meantime, what do you offer us better or more worthy of the gospel? Look around in this evangelical generation. Observe whether among them less indulgence is given to luxury, lust, or greed than among those whom you so detest. Show me any one person who by that gospel has been reclaimed from drunkenness to sobriety, from fury and passion to meekness, from greed to generosity, from reviling to well-speaking, from wantonness to modesty. Now, it may be my misfortune, but I have never known one individual who did not appear to be made worse by following your gospel. And, and he said this over and over again. Now, I was, I was stunned when I read this. And maybe Erasmus was overstating the case, but I, I was shocked. And yet, in a way, I, I, I don't think I should have been shocked because it's really hard to change a human being. It's really hard to change a human being. I remember this young man who was in our church. You know, he, uh, he, was in a, he you know, grew up in a very bad part of the town. Uh, he, the bus ministry of the church kind of scooped him up, and he became part of, of who we were. And he was given every opportunity. I think he, we, we sent him to Bible school, to university, to, to learn how, you know, how to handle the word, etc., and uh, he was given opportunity to preach when he got older. And you know, he just went off the rails. We gave him everything, everything that we thought we could give him, love, family, etc. But it just didn't, it, it didn't, it didn't deal with the, the difficult things that were deep down in his heart. And he went off the rails. It's really hard to change a human being. And uh, you know, in the United States, there's a $10 billion plus self-help industry, isn't there? $10 billion is spent on people trying to become better. And, and of course, that's just the United States. That's not everywhere else. And you know, it's growing, right? It's not like, okay, that's working. No, it's not working. And the reason we know it's not working is because it just keeps expanding year by year. It becomes more and more, more and more people spend money trying to change. So what is it that brings about transformation in a human life? If it's so hard, how do we change who we are into something we're supposed to be? How do we uncouple ourselves from where we are? Well, if you've got your Bible, and I'll read this if you don't, but uh, I want you to turn over to Genesis chapter 32. As Kathy says, it always comes back to Genesis. You know the story probably of Jacob, most of you. So Jacob is a twin. He's coming out of his mother's womb and he's holding on to his brother's heel. And so he's named Jacob, heel grabber. And, and what that essentially means is somebody who is, is grasping for what someone else has. They're uh, a manipulator. They're, uh, they'll maneuver you around to get what they want, etc. And we see the example of this right away. So you have Esau who comes in as they're older. Esau comes in from the field. He's famished. And there's Jacob with this red 
pot of stew. Um, today, in the, in the speaker's lounge, there was a choice of lunch. It was curry, and there was beef bourguignon. And I didn't want to have curry and be up here, because that wouldn't have been pretty. So, beef bourguignon, and you know, it, it just looked so beautiful. It's just this black, you know, mm, the meat, and, and Sarah, Sarah's over there saying, oh, this is so good. You, sh you should get this. So imagine, here's Jacob with this beef bourguignon. I guess they didn't, it wasn't French then, so. But something like that. And Esau comes in, and he smells this beautiful, you know, smell wafting towards him. And he says, I want that stuff. And you realize it's not, uh, it, it's not by chance that Jacob has the meal going at that point, right? Jacob has his eye on the prize at this point. I want what my brother has, and I'm going to maneuver him around to where I get that. So he doesn't share in a good Christian fashion. Do you want some of this? No, I'll sacrifice my portion. No, he's, he's going to take, you know, he's going to maneuver his brother. He knows his brother is a man of appetite, and so he goes against that weakness, and he maneuvers his brother around to give away basically the largest part of the inheritance. That's what the birthright is about. The oldest one gets the majority of the stuff. Now, in truth, that never ever really uh, came about, but that's what he's trying to do. And in case we miss what kind of character Jacob is as a heel grabber, you, you next see him in another scenario where he tricks his blind father into giving him the divine blessing from God through the patriarch to himself rather than to the brother who it should have gone to. Imagine that. I, feel, I always feel badly because... Jacob's blind, or I mean, excuse me, Isaac's blind, and Jacob fools him. That's just, that's so wrong, isn't it? How many of you are like, yeah, actually, I was going to do that next week? <laughs> None of you. No, it's just mean. It's, it's wrong. Uh, some of, um, I think it might have been JoJo said to me, so what, what movie are you, no, maybe it was Jonathan. He said, what movie are you going to cite? And I said, oh, Actually, this time I'm not going to cite a movie. I usually cite a movie. But if I was going to cite a movie, I'd say that Jacob... <laughs> Stop that. Jacob is like Loki in the Avengers. Yeah, now you know what I mean, right? You know, you kind of like the guy, but you're never going to trust him. Because he's going he's he's to do a fast one on you, and you won't even see it coming. He is manipulative. He's slimy. Uh, he's, uh, some people call him the trickster. That, that's what he's like. Anybody in here uh, been a used car salesman? No, nobody wants to. Now it's different, right? We're pre-owned, right? Pre-owned car salesman. Uh, I think it's different. But, you know, back in the day, stereotypically, used car salesman, you, you end up with a lemon. And you were glad about that because they're so tricky, and they just suck you in. That's Jacob. So you fast forward, Jacob ends up on the run. Uh, he marries his, his, the love of his life and someone else. Uh, yeah, that's awful, isn't it? Serves him right. Uh, oh, that wasn't Christian, was it? <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, his father-in-law is more of a manipulator than he is, so he gets back some of his own, and then he comes back. And, and eventually what happens is he ends up right at the place where he's got to face his greatest fear, which is facing his brother. And the last time that he saw his brother, his brother wanted to murder him. So 32, verse 22. That night Jacob got up, took his two wives, his two maidservants, and his 11 sons crossed the ford of the Jabbok, just a little tiny river on the east side of the Jordan. After he'd sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions till Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him till daybreak. Where did that guy come from? Some random stranger. Hey, want to wrestle? Uh, when Jacob saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched. And he wrestled, uh, uh, and he rest, excuse me, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched and he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it's daybreak. 
Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what's your name? Actually, it wasn't probably like that. It was probably more like this. Let me, let me go. It's daybreak. Because, you know, you're not going to have a nice conversation while you're wrestling. Anybody ever wrestled? Yeah, think back. When I was in high school. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can't even talk after 30 seconds of wrestling. Let me go. It's daybreak. I will, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What's your name? Jacob. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. You've struggled with God and with man, and you've overcome. Now, the name change means something. And it doesn't just mean, well, there's a prophetic symbol here in the future. It doesn't mean that. It means that something significant about him has changed. He is no longer the same manipulative person that he was before. And you don't see that kind of manipulation as you go forward. He's not perfect, you understand, but he's not the same person. He has changed from this heel-grabbing person to the person who's been struggling with God and has overcome. He's a different person. So here's the first point that I want to bring to you. And it's this. Transformation occurs in the encounter with God. Okay, it's difficult to change a human being, but transformation occurs in the encounter with God. Uh, my friend uh, told me some of his family's story a while ago. You may have heard this story because he's told it here. Uh, but his grandfather was a Christian, became a Christian, very legalistic in how he interacted, how he, how he did things. We all know people like that. But at the age of 70, God came to him, and he said essentially this, You've been very scrupulous with all that you've done, but you've missed something. You've missed love. So my friend's grandfather was devastated by this. And after a while, he went to each one of his children, and he apologized, told what had happened. And I don't know about the rest of the children, but with my, my friend's dad, it had a negative effect. He felt I probably betrayed because he would modeled his life, his Christianity, on that of his own father. And so uh, a week later, uh, my friend's mom has, has her Bible out, and he just says, shut that. We're not doing that anymore. And from that point on, the family stopped going to church. Uh, he stopped praying. He had an affair. He started doing things he hadn't done before. Uh, th there was a disjunction with the children so that uh, he, he became, uh, and I, I don't know him personally, but I understand kind of uh, a hard, somewhat distant not warm and fuzzy. And uh, because of the children, uh, he and his wife still lived in the house for many years, and so she eventually moved out. But they lived in the house for many years, and the only kind of interaction was pretty much yelling and screaming when they had to, had to interact. After 14 years, God came to him and said this, I forgive you for everything that you've done. And he was, he was undone by that. He couldn't believe that God still uh, loved him and hadn't withdrawn from him. After several days, I believe, of weeping, he called his wife. Remember, she'd moved out, and he asked her, if you'd be willing to forgive me, I would love to have you come home. If I can spend the rest of my life fixing what I've broken, it'll be a life well spent. That relationship between he and his wife is miraculously changed. Closer, warmer, more in touch with each other than ever before. And, and he's tried to um, reconcile with all of his children. Uh, um, how many of you came here in 1994? How many in 95? 96? 2006? Uh, you know, in 94, there was a lot of criticism of what was happening here, and people labeled it all kinds of things. You know, mass hysteria, emotionalism, uh, the devil, of course, that's always the label that gets, you know, slapped on. But in 1995, a sociologist by the name of Margaret Paloma came to John Arnott and said she wanted to do a study. And uh, he didn't really know her, so he thought, well, I'm not sure how this is going to turn out. Uh, what's her agenda? Is she competent? He didn't know. But in the end, he allowed her to do the study. And it was, uh, I think, 17 
different uh, countries. People came from 17 different countries, 40 different nations. Uh, there were somewhere under, just under a thousand people who responded. Most of them were well educated and had been in church leadership or in the circle of church leadership. And here's some of, the, some of the results of the study. And you can find this online. You can find a number of her studies online. This one's called By Your Fruits, You Shall Know Them. Uh, she said this, the majority recognized they've been touched by God. And over the passage of time, that had remained viable. What God had done continued. Only 9% said, yes, we had an encounter with God, but it seems like a distant memory now. 90% reported being more in love with Jesus. 55% said they'd been delivered by, from things like addictions, suicidal tendencies, irrational fears. 78% said they'd experienced an inner or emotional healing. 83% said they had an increased desire to share about Jesus, which is amazing because, uh, because the revival is not necessarily known for, wow, you know, great uh, evangelism. But actually that happened. There was evangelism. People went away feeling like, I want to talk about Jesus now. This is incredible. 88% said they had more love for their spouse. Come on. Nearly 70% said that their friends and family commented on the changes in them. It's not, not always about what you think, but is it actually evident to other people? Nearly 70% said, oh, somebody that I know said, what's happened with you? You've changed. Now, I say that not because we're talking about the renewal. It's always good to kind of look back because that's where we've come from. But it's not about that. It's about the God who comes in love and who transforms us when we encounter him. So the second thing I want to say is this. Transformation doesn't always occur in that moment. It occurs in multiple encounters over time. It occurs in process, which is kind of good because we, we live in a sort of testimony driven environment often and what the, the best testimonies are kind of like I was like this God slapped me down on the floor and I got up and I was different right that makes that's a, that's a good testimony well you know expanded a bit but actually for, for most of us if we hear that and we think oh man that hasn't happened to me then we feel, what's wrong with me? Well, nothing's wrong with you. It, 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 God often does encounters and moves us in process. If you think about, think about Jacob, uh, when he wrestled with the man at the Jabbok, it wasn't the first time that he'd encountered God. When he was fleeing from his brother, he went to the place that uh, would be called later Bethel. It's similar to the one in California. You can meet God there too. Uh, but there, you know, angels going up and down. And he, he sees all oh, mission. They're, they're, they're coming between heaven and earth. That's an encounter. And God is there speaking to him. He has this encounter. And look what happens. He, he says, wow, when he wakes up from his dream. If, he makes this pledge. God, if you, if you take me on this journey and bring me all the way back here safely, you can be my God. It's a little bit manipulative, isn't it? You know, if you take me out for dinner and buy me flowers, maybe you can, you can be my boyfriend. You know, it's a little bit like that. Oh, wait, that works, doesn't it? Sometimes it works, sorry. All right, so he has an encounter there. He has another one uh, when, when he's uh, in a really bad situation. God says, okay, it's time to go home. So off he goes. And then on his way home, as he's crossing one of the rivers, he sees there's a host of angels in this place. And he's so full of wonder. He says, uh, I'm going to name this Mahanam. I'm going to name this encampment because there's, the angels are encamping here. He's had multiple encounters as he's gone on. And each one has pushed him in this direction of transformation. And so encounters happen and transformation happens through process often. Not always. Sometimes it is in the moment, that one moment. Uh, we, we have this, I would say, a favorite story in the school. Uh, there was a young woman who came to the school a number of years ago. Beautiful young girl. Um, we, you know, we sort of loved her right from the start. 
uh, but she had anorexia. And, and she came to the school. We were doing everything that we knew. It wasn't helping. She was losing weight fast. And it got to the place where we were just you know, thinking about, let's send her home because uh, this is dangerous now. And we don't want her to die. She, she, she needs real help. And one night, what happened was, uh, in her, I think in her room, God came to her and said, uh, will you say yes to me? And she said, okay. And she was kind of angry, by the way, about a number of things. Okay, she said. The next morning, after a great night's sleep, she woke up. And she said, it was the first time that I'd woken up without being angry that I was still alive. And over time, God kept coming to her and giving her a, a, a little encounters and saying, will you say yes to me? One time, uh, they were, she was at Starbucks, and she normally had her coffee black, and God said, why don't you have a little milk? Now, if it was me, I would have said, have some cream <laughs> and put some butter on top of that, okay? But... I think God is so kind and how he knows. He knows what we can take. And he just said, well, why don't you have a little milk with that? And she said, okay. And, and it was steps like that that freed her from anorexia. I mean, that's astounding. Anorexia is so hard to deal with. My, my mother is also downsizing, and so she's trying to pawn things off on me. And, you know, a few weeks ago... Uh, I didn't even know we had it, but somehow it arrived in my car, this box with all these old things. And one of them was my undergrad paper on uh, uh, the biochemical basis of anorexia and bulimia. Whew. I opened that paper. I didn't understand anything. <laughs> I did not understand anything I'd written. It was like some madman that I didn't know wrote it and then put my, my name on it. Uh, but, you know, it's so hard to change something like that. It, you know, with human beings, it's almost impossible. But not with God. Not with God. And that happened over process. You know, we, we can't make transformation happen. And we can't make encounters with God happen. It's not like we can, you know, demand, God, come now. You know, it's never going to work. But what we can do is that we can seek God. This is my third point, by the way. We can seek God and we could submit to what he wants. Just like she did, she submitted to what he wanted. And that sets the, that sets the table. You know, if the, if the table's not set, if Kathy's cooking, I was going to say, if I was cooking, well, that, you don't want to know about that. Uh, if Kathy was cooking... If the table's not set, then, uh, you know, I'm, I'm probably not going to go and sit down. But when the table's set, we all come and sit down. And when we seek God and we, we submit to him, it sets the table for God to come into encounter with us and to meet us. Let me just read a few, uh, few scriptures for you. Jeremiah 29, 13. You'll seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And, and that's not talking about perfection. We don't have to be perfect. We just have to be on the journey. You'll find me if you seek me. James 4, 7, 8. Submit then to God. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. Come near to God. He'll come near to you. Now, we, we all know people who have had experiences with God. And they haven't changed, right? You know, how many of you know that? That's, that's the chief thing. When you say, this happens when you encounter God, but, you know, but we all know people like that. Yes, but here's the difference. How many of them continue to seek him and to submit to him? That makes all the difference. You know, Jacob could have stayed in, in Haran. I mean, he didn't want to come home. He was scared for his life. He could have stayed there. Lots of people stay in bad situations because they don't want to face the future, right? Could have stayed there, made a living, died, it would have been fine. Or he could have just escaped. He could have abandoned his family. He could have done a number of things, but he didn't. God says, I want you to go home. Oh, okay. 
I want you to face your brother. Okay, he tried to buy his brother off and that didn't work. Yeah, I'm going to split my family so that maybe he won't chase all of them. Maybe they'll get away. Maybe I'll get away. But in the end, he did. He submitted to what God wanted. And that changed him. That process changed him. The same, the same with, uh, with Abraham. He wasn't always Abraham. He was Abram. When God said, I want you to go to this country that you don't know anything about. So he left. And, and in the story of his life, there are multiple encounters that he has with God. And with every encounter, there's a, there's a kind of stepping up to do something more difficult. Okay, I know you're however old you are, but circumcision, dude. Ooh, could we avoid that, please? No. There's multiple steps until you get to, to Genesis chapter uh, 22. I want you to go. I want you to sacrifice the thing that you love most. Okay. And he's Abraham by that time. How'd that happen? Well, process of encounters and submitting, seeking God and submitting to him, that changed him. He couldn't have done what he did uh, in sacrificing or attempting to sacrifice his son way back there. He wasn't, he wasn't the right person yet. He didn't have what it, it, what it, what it took to do that. He didn't have the faith. He didn't have the trust because he was still Abram. So submission and seeking God in the, in the encounters changes us. It allows transformation to take place. You know, the thing is, most of us, most of us think about encounters as these earth-shaking, technicolor, immersive IMAX experiences, don't we? Well, the heavens were ripped open and I, whoa, I saw God and I couldn't move and I couldn't speak. And, and of course, that, that's absolutely true and those things happen. But sometimes in thinking of those things, we minimize the non-IMAX experiences. And I don't want to say that each one of those is valuable for us. If you think about Elijah, um, he's had this great time tweaking the beard of the king, showing off God's power, and now he's being chased by his wife. Well, not his wife, but maybe his wife chased him as well, I don't know. But anyway, he's chased by Ahab's wife, Jezebel. And, and he's, so, he's so depressed and under it that he, can, he can't even eat. And an angel comes to him and feeds him. That's, that's an IMAX experience, wouldn't you say? Yeah, pretty cool. Uh, I don't know about you, if you're lying in bed on a Saturday morning saying, I can't get up to eat, but... And then somebody arrives with your breakfast. That would be pretty cool. Doesn't happen in my house, unfortunately. Uh, pray for her, guys. No. For that anointing to come upon her. No. Uh, and, and then he goes on to the mountain. He regains strength. He goes on to the mountain. And, and what occurs there is what, what you would say are typical uh, theo theophanies, uh, demonstrations of God, what he looks like when he comes. So there's a wind that's so powerful, it's ripping the rocks off of the mountain. It's a hurricane. And, and then there's the there's earthquake and a fire Typical things. Those are IMAX experiences. Like, wow. Well, you're probably shaking to death at the same time. But wow, as part of that. But the most important of that event, that episode, is right after that. When God comes, we call it the, you know, the soft, still voice or the thin silence is probably a little bit more literal. There's, God comes in this minimal kind of way. And that's the point that is, that is raised above all the others in that setting. It's not an IMAX experience, but it's powerful. So let's not, when we're thinking about experiences with God that make a difference in our lives, let, let's not think about, woo, that thing out there all the time. It, you know, encounters with God run, run the gamut. They come in all shapes and sizes. And each one has the potential of changing us into something better than we are now. All right, what does this matter? This matters 
because we need more than we've got now. We need more than we have now. We need more transformation in our midst than we have now. And not only us, but the world. The, the world needs to see that we carry something that's bigger than they have now. You know, God, God wants to do something. I, I feel like sometimes we're, we're, you know, we're trying to help people along with rewarmed, uh, Christianized self-help techniques. And I'm not saying they don't have any impact. Some of those things are really actually helpful. Anything that's helpful is good. Anything that is helpful is good. But we want something more. We want something bigger. If we're going to go to the, to the next level as it is, we need that kind of transformation that comes when we encounter God. That's what we need. And, and of course, maybe I'm preaching the choir here because you guys are all here for this conference. You've paid money. You've traveled to come to this place. And primarily, it's probably not been for the speakers, although the speakers have been great. Up till now. Uh, uh, but, but you've come because you expect that something of God is here. You, you want to encounter God. And many of you have actually had significant encounters while you've been here. But I think overall, uh, our, our expectations have probably dropped. Not in this moment, but overall in our lives. Our expectations of encountering God, our expectations of, of change in ourselves and in others has, has kind of dropped. And, and, and that, needs to, that needs to ramp up. And that will ramp up as we have more experience, as we seek him and submit to him. So why don't we just stand? If you can, if you'd like to, let's stand. <sighs> Holy Spirit, just come right now. Just come. Will you come and bring the Father to us? Bring Jesus to us. Come and kiss us. Wow. Wow. Just take a big breath right now, the Holy Spirit. Wow. Yes, Lord, more. Just come. Just come meet us right now. Let's have another breath. Why don't you just put your hand in your heart? Just repeat after me. Lord, I reject any thoughts that you don't encounter us. I reject any thought that you won't encounter me, that I'm not important enough, that I'm not good enough. I reject those thoughts. Reignite me, Lord. Give me more passion. Increase my expectation. Increase my reality. Come and encounter me. Come and meet me. I repent. For having low expectations. Please forgive me, Lord. And draw near to me. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Actually, actually, just before you sit down, just stay in that moment just for a little bit longer. I feel like the Father wants to clear up a couple of things and I think one thing is if you feel like you're walking with a limp like not necessarily your body though it could be your body but inside limping because of your wrestle with him and it's and it's left this hurt and kind of bitterness in you I feel like the father wants to clean that up and so just if if that's you just taking a moment and I actually you know, I don't always feel this, but I feel like the Father is here coming to you 
and saying, I am so sorry. I'm sorry what, what that wrestle has, has left, the residue that that wrestle has left in you that is not, that is not my heart. And, and, and I'm, I feel like the Father is actually asking you for forgiveness. Would you forgive me? It's a bit weird to forgive God because he's holy and pure and perfect, and we know that, but, but he comes in heart as your father. And I, I can even see this picture with, with him, and it, again, it messes with our kind of academic minds of how it is with the father, but I see him getting low, you know, and we saw Jesus get low all the time and come low right in front of you and ask you, would you forgive me? Would you forgive me? And I just see him like reaching out with his hand and as he lays his hand like right on your chest, I think it's intentionally on your chest because that's where, you know, the, the heart sits in that area and just, he just lays and that fire of love and I, and I hear the word consumption that fire of consumption where the father consumes i feel him saying i'm consuming pain and i'm consuming the limp and i am setting you free to stand up and to run the distance to run the distance with him and what's in your heart and what's in his heart and I can just see the Father just, he just extends his hand and he gives you like a godly push in the back and he's like, you go, you run, you go for it. And that thing is settled. In the name of Jesus, I also think he wants to do one other cleanup thing. And that cleanup, if you heard him yesterday, when I was speaking or any of the others were speaking, God or the Holy Spirit or Jesus challenging you to do something and it's challenging you to say yes when you've been saying no or to say no when you've been saying yes or you know even that invitation this morning to go and make something right. I feel like the Father is saying, I want clean up here. I, this, you know, his, the graciousness of the Father is he will keep coming back around to the same thing again and again. He does not want any of us to walk out these doors by the end of this tonight without that clean up being done. I, I think it's actually something quite serious for us. So if there is something, again, just, just, um, um, I was thinking if you feel particularly brave, you could turn to the person beside you and just say, this is actually what God's asked me to do, and this is what I'm going to do, or I'm still wrestling with it. I'm going to be praying when you're doing that, so I want, you to, I want you to do that right now. Do you know when we speak something out loud, oh, it's much harder to ignore it? much harder to ignore it. So, Father, I ask as we just take a minute here and turn to each other and kind of um, share that thing that you're asking us to, to, to do or to change or that person you're asking us to reach out to, God, that that is a stake in the ground that will never, ever move again except to do something good for you. Okay, so two seconds. Turn to someone beside you that you don't know or do know. See how risky you can be. Be like, okay, I think God is just asking me to do this. And uh, then we are going to get you ready for your next speaker here. Okay, just beautiful. So, if I can start wrapping you up, let's give a big hand to Gordon Harris. Thank you so much.
Gordon for, um, for that. You know, again, I'm a bit biased, but I love hearing the word like that. I love the way God has gifted him to unpack something and, and give us a really, really something really solid and, and really deep. And now I have the pleasure of introducing one of my other favorite people in the world. And this is Sarah Jackson. Sarah is married to Ben Jackson, who is over there. And um, they are dear friends of ours. And Sarah has uh, um, worked with us at the school ministry for, for many, many years. And we have had, again, the most beautiful time seeing God move and seeing how he does things so beyond us. And she has recently um, had three beautiful little girls, quite recently, you know, over the last six years or so. And so she's tempor temporarily, is it okay to say that, resigned her position with us, which, um, you know, that, that was a very big deal for, for all of us. But to watch her with her girls, man, if we had parents that got us from birth, really realizing how God speaks and loves and works, and um, you're doing an absolutely beautiful job, and I love you dearly, and you are in for a big <laughs> treat. So let's just, yeah, give her a big hand, and let's just, um, let's just pray for her. Let's just, where you are, just reach out your hands, and, and um, Holy Spirit, here is your girl who just stands here before you and, 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 and takes like just another gulp of your presence. And Holy Spirit, even while she's speaking, would you just be whispering in her ear and moving her to the right and the left and in and out of her notes and her preparation. And Father, I pray that there is just uh, an eruption of your love in this place this afternoon. Thank you for Sarah. Thank you for her husband, Ben, and her, and her darling little babes. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, Kathy, your phone, if you'd like it. You know, it could be quite exciting to find what texts you get in, but I thought I'd give it back. Well, delightful people, I'm very excited to be here this afternoon. And I thought I'd just start telling you how Ben broke my rib before we'd started dating. So there was a day, a day in December. It was snowy, it was icy cold. Ben and I were both um, separately um, speaking. I was speaking and he was leading worship at our downtown uh, church. And so with a bunch of friends, we went down there. And when we came back, um, all, the, uh, all the group of friends decided to go sledding. And, and so I'm like, yes, I will go sledding too. And so there we are in about three feet of snow, we sled. And then the guys start, decide to start rugby tackling the girls. And, you know, everyone's like, ha, 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 you know, falling back in the fluffy Canadian snow. And uh, this guy uh, comes over and uh, rugby tackles me, and I fall back, not into three feet of fluffy snow. I fall back into three inches of snow. And as I thunk onto the hard ground, and I see Ben sailing through the air, and, and then I feel that moment, and I hear the moment that my rib crunches. Now... Between you and me, I really fancied him. So, you know I did. So, I'm like, oh, no, I'm fine. Oh, kind of like, oh, I'm, I'm okay. And I'm, I'm trying to just be like, it's okay. And so I walk back across the hilly golf course and I realize, oh my, it hurts to breathe and it hurts to laugh and it hurts to speak and it really hurts climbing over that fence. Uh, but I, I make a decision which in hindsight was an unwise decision. And that was that I would go home and sleep on it and see how it was in the morning. And if it was worse, I'd go to the ER then. Well, in the middle of the night, I wake up. I'm terribly dehydrated because I've dug my car out of the three feet of snow three times that day. And I, I discover that ribs 
are a vital part of rolling, moving, and I am in excruciating pain. And I, I mean, it takes me about 10 minutes to get out of bed. And I take the, my glass and I, I walk down the hallway in my apartment. And because of the pain, I pass out. I drop the glass, it smashes, slices my leg open really deeply, and I fall back unconscious, and I smack the back of my head against uh, the stone floors and crack the back of my head open. It was a good beginning, guys. <laughs> I feel like if it was a Viking mythology, babe, you'd get some, like, Ben Jackson, rib breaker kind of name. But... It's just us. Head smasher. I just, I'm not sure I like that one. My, my roommate takes me to hospital and, uh, you know, they, they staple me, they stitch me, they x-ray me, they pump me full of fluids. And uh, I went home with a wonderful cone-shaped bandage on and the most terrible, terrible concussion. I mean, I could hardly, I, I probably couldn't have walked across this stage. I was just so concussed in so much pain. And, you know, I was in bed for a few days. And toward the end of the week, I, I realized that it's not that my roommate has, has been just feeding me really mediocre food. Sorry, Mel. Uh, <clears throat> but actually that I can't smell anything. And as the next weeks uh, go on, I go to doctors and then spe specialists. And on this one morning um, in January, I go to a specialist and I, woke a, I wake up in the morning and I have an old Ron Canoli song in my head. You know that, whose report will you believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. Oh, I think I got that note. And, uh, you know, the song kind of goes on to say, his report says, I am healed. His report says, I am free. And I'm driving to the specialist, and I have that moment where I think, huh, I'm not a morning person. There's not much that happens in my brain in the morning. I wonder why that song went through my head. Ah, oh, maybe that was the Holy Spirit speaking to me. Huh. Maybe I'm going to have an opportunity to choose whose report will I believe. And lo and behold, when that specialist says, you will never taste or smell again, you, the things that connected your nose to your brain, they shattered in the type of fall you had, you'll never taste or smell again, thanks very much, have a nice life. People's skills were a little on the low side, I have to say. And that, that moment, that moment as I, I had choice, that diagnosis, I, I, I remember driving home, crying all the way home, and, and just praying and saying, Jesus, I choose to believe your report that says I'm healed. And I'm, I feel filled with weakness. I, I, I struggle to sort of like sit for the whole day, and I began to experience lots of the after effects of that head injury. And in the next few months, I would, I would call that year probably one of the best and worst years of my life, because I began to experience the PTSD from the head injury. Um, I began to um, experience huge amounts of anxiety, you know, even being alone, and I... I need to be alone. I'm, I need the introvertedness in order to flourish as the extrovert. Um, I am, Ben asks me out and we start to date. And so I am like on the highest high and the lowest low. And I am getting everybody and their dog to pray for me for healing. And nothing is happening. And I'm sure there are many of you who have experienced traumas, who have experienced accidents, who have experienced moments of great weakness in your life. You know, 
I would have said before that I had everything going for me. I was walking, working at a dream job with a dream group of friends. I was falling in love with this amazing man. You know, I was pastoring, I was leading, I was fulfilling the call of God in my life. And suddenly, in a moment, I am plunged into the greatest place of weakness in my life. And I have nothing. The things that I know to do are not working, like Gordon said. I would, you know, Ben and I would have a slightly, you know, difficult conversation. And I would just plunge off the cliff of anxiety and I couldn't pull up. And all the things that I knew to do, they didn't work. And so, you know, the number of times that I turned up at Gordon and Kathy's house crying, because I'm like, I'm crying and I can't stop. And I don't know what to do. So I'd be knock on the door and Gordon would be open and be like, come in, just come. I would be, no words were spoken. I'd be ushered in. And so what does it look like to say yes to God in weakness? What does it look like to say yes to God when your circumstances, your physical circumstances, models this for us beautifully? You know, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, each of these gospels record the moment of Jesus' baptism. You know, there he is. He's, in, he's, he's at the starting point of his ministry. He's in the starting blocks. He's ready to go. He is about to step into his three years of public ministry that we see on the earth. And John the Baptist is doing a baptism of repentance. You know, John Bevere talked about repentance the other night. This was a serious baptism. It wasn't like a frivolous, like, woo. This was like a serious moment in, in these people's lives. And Jesus, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God, comes to John and says, baptize me. And John is like, no, 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 no. Like, you know, whether it was by the Spirit of God recognizing in him, he, he was like, no, you need to baptize me. But Jesus, Jesus chose to stand with us. He, he didn't receive that baptism because he needed to repent. He, as he descended into the waters of the Jordan, Jesus chose to stand with us in our weakness. He chose to identify with us in our weaknesses, in our sufferings. He came, Jesus came in his humanity into that baptism saying, I'm here and I'm, I'm in need. I'm dependent, Heavenly Father, because Jesus was looking ahead, I would say, to the next three years to come. The opposition, the challenges, Judas, the cross. You know, Jesus had probably been dreaming and praying and looking with his Heavenly Father into this next portion. And so as he stood in the waters of the Jordan... Jesus stood fully identified with you and me. And, and Luke records that as he stood there, he prayed. And I would say stepping into the waters was his yes, but his prayer, his prayer in that moment as he's standing there, I don't know, I remember as a child, um, we, went, we went to these Christian camps and I remember my dad baptizing some people in the river. Now, obviously that was in the UK, the weather was cold, the river was cold, and I remember some of the people getting baptized. Um, my dad was like, could, could we hurry up a bit because I can feel the fish nibbling on my legs. And it was cold and it was murky. You know, I don't know about you, but I'm not a huge fan of murky water. We went, um, we went swimming in a Tennessean lake uh, about three weeks ago. And, you know, we were in this lovely state park with, you know, our kids, our friends' kids. And, and my friend suddenly says, oh! I was like, what is it? And, you know, the water is rich brown. You know, and it was so hot that the water wasn't even refreshing. It was sort of slimy. But the children are, like, having fun, and you're like, oh, here we are having fun, children. And, and my friend suddenly says, oh! 
I remember they have water mockers and snakes here. I was like, what? She was like, snakes, poisonous snakes that swim in the water. I'm like, okay, children, one more minute until we get out. Out we come. I'm like, you, you tell me there are poisonous snakes that swim? Why are we in this water? Now, I'm not, I'm assuming that there was not water moccasins in the River Jordan. Were there poisonous snakes there? Gordon's shaking his head. There were not poisonous snakes. But there he is, Jesus, standing in the river, standing in that place of dependence, in, of weakness. And he's standing there because of you. And he's standing there because of me. And he's standing there so that each one of us, when we face weakness in our lives, we, when we pray and invite God in, we can know what to expect. Because you see, um, Ed Purick says that we can see what he prayed by the answer that came. Because the, the answer that came was he heaven was ripped open and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the form of a dove. The Holy Spirit came upon him, filled him, anointed him, and empowered him for that which was to come. When we pray and invite God in, in our place of weakness, he comes to us to strengthen us, to give us courage, to anoint us for the place he's called us to be. And secondly, the voice of the Father resounds from heaven. One trans translation said, the Father shouts his love over his son. This is the beginning. This is the moment where, you know, if you've ever been a coach or a parent or really for somebody, they're about to, they're about to start and often, often you're shouting last minute instructions. You know, keep your eyes on the prize, head up, chin down, focus. You know, we have all sorts of pep talks, don't we? Like, let's be real. But the Father, our Heavenly Father, the one thing He says to inaugurate, to begin the day of Jesus' public ministry is, You are my beloved Son, and in you I am so pleased. I am delighted in you. You haven't done anything. He hasn't begun yet. He hasn't faced the, the devil in the temptations in the desert. And yet already his father is saying, Jesus, you're my beloved son. And in you, I am well pleased. And what Jesus models for us there is what we can expect in our moments of weakness. And we can expect the infilling of the Holy Spirit and we can expect his love to come and find us. Because his love, our heavenly father's love is coming to find you because you are his beloved child in whom he's well pleased even if you're standing here in, in the biggest mess and mistake of your life, you are still his beloved child and he wants to wrap you and find you with love. Love that may look nothing like your earthly parents were able to give. Love that is powerful, safe, and strong. Can I tell you how, how his love found me? You know, in those few months after, um, after the head injury and as I'm, I'm pressing in and praying for healing, I remember one of the, th I remember feeling so weak that often in the evening I'd go home to, to my apartment and I, I, didn't ha I didn't have the energy to pray. I felt physically the effects of the trauma and the accident and even in myself just so sad. It was so scary not to have a sense of smell. It, it, it's so linked to that personal sense of safety. And oh, did I mention my two hob hobbies? Cooking food and eating food. Like those are my great passions in life. And suddenly it, I might as well have been eating cardboard. If I closed my eyes, I had no idea what was in my mouth. 
And as I was in that, those months of grieving that, it was, it was such a strange juxtaposition of highs and lows. And I would go home and I would just put on songs that spoke about God's my healer. And when I couldn't speak out my yes, I listened to the yes. And I would lie on my bed and soak and just weep in my weakness. You know, I don't even know if it was, I don't know that it was any healing weeping. It was just, I'm here. And all I can do right now is position myself in, I'm listening to this song and I declare that you are my healer and nothing is impossible for you. Now, in, in those few months, Ben and I were falling head over heels in love. But it was triggering immense amounts of anxiety and fear in me. And my emotions were a bit glitchy, so they would sort of connect in and out. So I would be, f- I would be so in love with him and yet filled with fear. What if I'm making a mistake? How do I know? Why, why are my emotions not like normal? <laughs> I'm like, because you had a massive head injury. Actually, this summer, we went, we went to Canada's Wonderland with our good friends. And as we were there, I was like, it's been so long since we've been here. And Canada's Wonderland is a massive roller coaster park just close to here. And I was like, Ben, how long has it been? I'm like, I think it must have been 10 years. And then I have this moment. I think we bought an all-season pass for Canada's Wonderland for the six months after I had a traumatic head injury. I was like, I'm like, that's why I hated it that summer. I remember not enjoying it. I I sort of had this moment of revelation. That was uh, just a few weeks ago, fresh, fresh off the press, people. You know, I felt deeply out of control. You know, I felt anxious because, I mean, seriously, this man is a champion. If he married me after that year, I knew we could face anything. (laughs) Like, Gordon and Kathy, no, I'm not joking or exaggerating in that moment. But I was, I was, I could tell, I could sense that Ben was getting ready to ask me to marry him. And I was getting filled with all this, like, what am I doing? Am I making a st- mistake? And then I would be like, no, I love him. I can't live without him. And just a terrible jumble. Just, you know, the head injury stuff messing with everything. And I was just... Just pr- I'd just be like, God, help me, help me. I, I, I'm, I'm so weak. I, I don't even know what's up or down. And, you know, at that, one of the lowest points, I experienced the love that finds me. Like Gordon said, it's a process. It's, there are big encounters that are the technicolor, and then there are the whisper encounters. And on this day, we were, I was working in the school of ministry, and there was a huge power cut in the whole area. I had an inside office and a desktop, so I couldn't work. So we decided to go in and sit in on the, the session for the basically the advanced class in the school. And Chris Vallotton was speaking. It was the last morning he was there. And, you know, he finishes speaking, and it's great and encouraging. And, and then he, he, he just starts, he starts prophesying over the student. And uh, Kathy and I were sitting kind of quite separate at the back with his wife. And, you know, I'm just sitting there sort of like, oh, that's great. Yep. And inside there's always that whirring of like anxiety that I'm like trying to keep a lid on. And he, he prophesies to the students and then he just points out me and he's like, you. I'm a bit like, oh, oh yes. Oh, great. And he, and he, he just said like two, three simple sentences. But this was love finding me. He said, I see you in a wedding dress. I don't, have you just got married or are you about to? And he said, the Lord wants you to know that he has sabotaged every other relationship you've had because he has saved you for that man. And I don't know about you, but, you know, Christian singles, that's like the million-dollar prophecy. So the entire room erupts in laughter and like, woo! And I just begin to sob and sob and weep because love found me. Love found, I was, I wasn't, I was being found by my heavenly Father's love. 
Because I could feel the Holy Spirit set on me. I could feel like, oh, this relief came into my heart of, I knew this, but I just needed you to, I need, like this has found me in a way I never knew I needed to be found. And then everybody in the room became super awkward because no one knew why I was crying. So all the people who were like, yes, yes, oh, oh. Uh, like, should we make eye contact? Maybe we shouldn't. <laughs> Kathy knew she was my wing woman, but everybody else you could tell was a bit like, ah, uh, ah, uh, like, does she want to be married? She doesn't. We know she's dating Ben. Maybe, you know, you could just, you could see it all go through their head in that moment. But I was experiencing the love of my father wrapping me round. I was experiencing peace that just came to the deepest part of me. And that encounter, that moment, I was found by love. And I, it changed me. And I would say from that point on, my emotional stability began to shift. It didn't, compl- it didn't I didn't get up and be like, woohoo, no more anxiety. But when anxiety tried to knock on the door, I, would, I had it written in my journal, and I'd just go back to it. I'd be like, no, this is what God said. And it would just, my heart would settle down again. And over the next few months, as we got engaged and we got married, that, that word was an encounter that was an anchor for me in the storm of that year. Let me ask you a question. What stops you from saying yes in your weakness? Because the thing is, many of us experience weakness, but we don't invite God in. We are really good at like (laughs) holding it together in Jesus' name and just kind of forging onwards and just holding our strength and our brittle okayness together as we just keep moving on and we fear letting go. Or maybe we really don't like being weak or vulnerable. I remember the first time I ever heard someone speak a message on embracing weakness and standing in the place of Jesus. I was so angry. And do you know why I was angry? Because I had spent most of my life trying to embrace strength to protect myself. That message offended me. I remember Ed Purick was just, he talked about, now we're going to just step into the place of weakness with Jesus. And I was like, are you kidding me? And I just... I just spent the entire ministry time in this sort of heated conversation with Jesus, as, and then Jesus just began to dissolve. You know when you start to kind of melt a little bit, and I'm like, wow, the picture I have is of me covered in armor, covered in hard, protective walls. And I was like, huh, I guess it's hard for you to get in when I'm all like, get back, I am strong. Not that I'm sure you do that. But uh, in 2 Kings 5, we see another man who was invited to step into the waters of the Jordan. Who was invited to step into the waters of the Jordan in weakness. To say yes to vulnerability. To say yes to, to... Here I am. I'm standing in weakness And it's over to you now, God. And that was Naaman. You know, Naaman was the commander of the army of Aram. He was basically the second most powerful person in the country. He was wealthy. He was powerful. He was respected by the king and by everybody else. He had it going on. Except for one small thing. Well, not really small. But he had... He had a tremendous weakness because he had leprosy. He had an incurable skin condition that would get worse and worse until death. Now, we don't know whether the the leprosy of then is the leprosy that we understand as that disease today. But, you know, 
I'd encourage you to look online at some photos of what happens to your skin. Because you begin to get these large kind of plates that become hard areas of skin that lose all sensation, raised, uh, and they just grow and grow until they cover your body, and then you start to injure yourself because you have no sensation, and then you get infections, and the infections can lead to death. You, 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 you can be, begin to be deformed. That was a tremendous place of weakness for a man who was powerful, who was wealthy, who was used to being in control. And in, in, in 2 Kings, you see the story of he hears of the man of God who could heal him. And he arrives with his entourage. It doesn't say that he came to Elisha's house with his chariot. It says that he, uh, he went with his horses and his chariots. Like there was a massive group of people who arrived. And when you're wealthy and powerful, you expect to be treated often as though you're wealthy and powerful. I, I certainly would say that Naaman seemed to expect to be treated as wealthy and powerful. And when he arrives, does Elisha dash out to meet him and whip out the red carpet and say, I've got some tea and nibbles inside. Come on in, Naaman. No, he does not. Not only does he not come outside, but he sends a servant to deliver a message. I think that might have been a little bit offensive to Naaman's understanding of who he was. And that and the servant basically says to him, go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and you'll be healed of your leprosy. But it says, but Naaman became angry and stalked away. I thought he would certainly come out to meet me, he said. I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call on the name of his Lord his God and heal me. Aren't the rivers of Damascus, the Abana and the Fafa? Papa, better than any of the rivers of Israel. Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? And so he turned and went away in a rage. Naaman was offended. He was angry. His pride was offended. He was proud. He was strong. He was capable. And those things almost cost him his healing. Are there things in our lives that would cost us our encounter because we can't say yes in a place of weakness? What happens when God asks you something that doesn't look the way you imagine it to be? You're like, no, but I just thought the man of God would come forward and place a glowing hand upon my head and he didn't even pray for me. It was like a student, an, a not fully graduated student from the School of Ministry who came and prayed for me. You guys are awesome. But, but sometimes we get a picture in our head of how God will meet us. And when it doesn't happen that way, we can be a bit like, well, does, Lord, do you not know who I am? I am a pastor and a leader. I am successful. I am capable. That person couldn't speak English properly when they prayed for me. How often do we have a picture in our head? And when it doesn't happen the way we imagine, we become offended. And when we do that, I believe we walk away from the opportunity to say yes in our weakness. Yes in our, there's no great answer yet. And you know, I don't know what you use to protect your weakness. You know, we, we do different things, don't we, when we're in distress? Maybe it's strength. Maybe you choose hardness, like, oh, no, I don't care, it's fine, it's all good, it doesn't matter. Maybe you choose busyness. Maybe there's lots of different things that we can hide our hearts behind. But I, I feel this afternoon the Lord is inviting us He's inviting us to stand in the place of weakness and say, I need you. I need you. I need your love. I need you, Holy Spirit. I, I feel weak. 
I don't know what the answers are to the problems I face. I don't know how to fix me. I don't even know how to pray, but I need you. And his invitation to you today is to let down the the things that we hide behind. Maybe you feel shame that you are weak, that you feel needy. Maybe you don't like that about yourself. Maybe you feel angry that you actually need something that the God hasn't answered you secretly in the prayer closet. Or maybe you'd like God to answer you by a great prophetic word. But God wants to meet our hearts. He wants to encounter us and with the love that finds us. His love came to find Jesus and his love, he wants to wrap around and find you in the neediest and weakest places of your life. This morning isn't really about the fact that God healed me. He did 100% heal my sense of taste and smell. I just want to throw that into the story, you know, for the story arc. But I think more importantly of that was, was his love that kept finding me in that season. That place of, even when, you know, I was in places where people had words of knowledge about somebody who'd lost their ten- sense of taste and smell. And I was like, woohoo, I am here. I'm like, I know how to respond to a word of knowledge. I'm coming by faith. I would receive the word by faith. Here I am. I've been praying for this. Did anything happen? Not a whisper. I snorted more scented lip balm and I couldn't smell a thing. And then when the healing started coming, it was not even like a boom, spectacular healing. It was like an incremental lurching healing that happened like increment by increment and half of it was really horrible. (sighs) My healing did not look like I expected it to do. But at every point I had a choice whether I would say yes to the unexpected or whether I would be offended close my heart and complain about what God was doing. What will your choice be? Because these are the real things we do. They're the real things I do, and maybe your neighbor, your friend, your spouse also does them, so. But this isn't just about the love that finds us once, like Gordon said. This is about his love that keeps on finding us. You know, You know, Kathy mentioned, I've, you know, I resigned my job at the school to to look after my my three girls who are like the greatest joy, such a gift to us. I just, it was so the right decision. I love them. But it is, it has plunged me and probably into one of the, another season of great weakness I've really struggled these last two years, letting go of something that I've loved. And do you know what? I've just been so busy. I've been very busy being a mother. So busy being a mother. You just have to do lots of cleaning and like wiping off vomit and other bodily fluids. And then you're like putting them down for naps, getting them up, putting them down, getting them up, taking them to school, cleaning them, doing the laundry, doing da 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 da. And you know, the list is never done. You are busy all day long. You know what, this summer, I really felt the love that finds me come and find me. Not in a technicolor, dream coat, glory, prophetic word from the prophet way, but in those little whispers of love where I could just feel that nudge on my heart of, hey. And when I would go to spend time with the Lord, I'd feel him say, just tell me about your heart. I'd be like, oh, I'm so busy, Lord. I'm just busy being busy and being a wonderful mother to my child. What do you want to say about that ministry time next week? And he was like, Sarah. And I was like, oh. You know, eventually, after he nudged me enough, I got down to the reality of, oh, I feel sad. This has been hard. It's been right, but it's been hard, and that's such a tricky juxtaposition. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Like right and hard and right, and I thought it would just be a little like scampering through the fields of motherhood, you know, like on Instagram where they're like, ha, 
here I am, fashionably dressed and laughing while I eat ice cream with my children. And I'm like, there seems less of that and more of like, there's bodily fluids leaking out of them and I didn't bring another outfit. But, you know, as, as I've allowed myself, as I've chosen to, to invite God into the places of weakness, to actually verbalize to him, oh, I feel sad. This has been hard. I miss working with my best friends. I want to go back and just have fun. And instead I'm like, oh, sweeping up the Cheerios, chiseling the Rice Krispies off the table. And when I, when, I, when I said yes to him in weakness, I, I began to feel that funny numbness that had crept up on me begin to dissipate. Because to be honest, I'd been numbing myself with my busyness. I'd been trying to be busy so that I didn't feel the sadness that I felt. But actually, when I allowed God into that place of weakness, I can feel these little seedlings of hope and anticipation. Because there were moments in the sadness where you begin to think, nothing will ever be that good again. Anybody else make large, dramatic, sweeping statements about their life when they feel sad? I see you. It's all over. I will never be happy again. I've obviously peaked, you know, and I, I, you know, I have these dramatic conversations with the Lord, and then I'm laughing, you know, I'm journaling, and I'm like saying these dramatic things, like, this is it, Lord. I'm so sad. I've obviously had the best days of, oh. And then I'm, and then I, because I, I laugh. So then I'm laughing at myself like, Sarah, I'm like, Lord, and I can feel him laughing and weeping with me in that sort of, you're funny. Oh, but I feel, I feel your heart. Let me wrap around you with love again. And so I am right in the middle of being found by love again in a new season, in a season where I'm like, oh, it's uncomfortable. I, th I thought I'd been found by love already. I've had my Jacob moment. I've come back in triumph. I've been healed. And yet, I am glorying in being found by love again. Because that love is bringing hope to life. And joy to life. And choice to life. And it's come in the whispered moments of, Jesus, let me tell you what my heart really feels. Not in any like intercessory lunging moment of ninja fabulous, but just me being me with my heavenly daddy. And I'm feeling the, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, the, the strength and the courage to move forward into what's next. And so this afternoon... I want to invite you to come forward and to stand in weakness with Jesus. Because he's waiting to find you with his love. He's waiting to find you raw, unedited, beautiful, chosen you. Oh, he's already here. <laughs> Why don't you stand to your feet for a moment? <sighs> and if you would, close your eyes. And, and I'd invite you to just to look and to see Jesus stepping into the waters of the Jordan. He's stepping 
into the midst of the greatest place of weakness and pain in your life. And he's standing there before you with his arms outstretched. And he's saying, would you come and join me? Because I want to meet you here. And maybe for you, you want to whisper a response to him to say, I choose to stand with you in weakness, Jesus. Some of you may feel that you need to repent of the things you've hidden behind. You've hidden behind strength. You've hidden behind busyness, behind numbness, behind pride. But this morning he's saying, would you come, beloved? I I just want to invite those of you who feel like you want to stand in weakness with Jesus to come to the front this morning, this afternoon. I just feel as we come before you, Jesus, I just feel for us to stretch our hands to him. And it can just be as simple as, I need you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. And if you can, invite him in to your place of weakness. I need you, Jesus. I need you, Holy Spirit. I need you, Father. Right now, as you come, you can expect the infilling of the Holy Spirit. He is beginning to come and rest upon you all across this place. Some of you may feel just a a peace come upon you. Some of you may, may begin to feel a trembling, a fire in your hands, in your head. Some of you may just begin to sense him just so gently with you that is the infilling filling of the Holy Spirit maybe just by faith that is just as powerful as any other way thank you Holy Spirit Father God we We, your people, stand before you. We come in need. We come in dependence. We come in weakness. And we invite you to come and fill us right now. Holy Spirit, would you light upon our heads and our hearts And Father, would you come and wrap around us with love. And I speak, uh, wow, an anointing of the Father's love over you right now. And I just see the Father coming and covering you with love. Father, would you come to the places of pain and say, you are my beloved child. In you, I am well pleased. 
just take a moment and receive from Him. Maybe you need to pour your heart out to Him. I feel like there's some of you here that you have been, you feel so burdened that you've been carrying all this responsibility, all this heaviness. And I just sense right now the Father is just coming to lift that heaviness off your hearts right now in Jesus' name. There's some of you who've been carrying family responsibility, burdens from your family, burdens from your workplace. Um, And I just see the Father lifting that emotional and spiritual weight off your heart right now. In Jesus' name, if that's you, just raise your hand to him and just say, yes, I say yes to you. I give you those burdens. I let them go. I just want to release the ministry team to begin laying hands on people and just blessing and infilling of our heavenly daddy's love. One of the words the Lord spoke to me for this ministry time was John 12, 24. About unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground, dead to the world, it's never more than a grain of wheat. But if it is buried, it sprouts and reproduces itself many times over. In the same way, anyone who holds on to life just as it is destroys that life. But if you let it go reckless in your love, you'll have it forever, real and eternal. And I just sense there were some people that you have been holding on to something old, trying to keep it. And I I sense today the Lord just saying, let it go. Let it go. You're trying to keep that old life alive and today it's time to let it go. And I don't say those words lightly because I know how hard that can be. And maybe for you, you want to picture that thing in your hands. Just say, Father, I give that thing to you. And you can name it out. I give that relationship. I give that job. I give that old way that things used to be. That And today, I let it go. I let it go. I... Would you bury it? Let that thing come to death in my life. Wow. Come, Holy Spirit. Wow. I just I just sense the Lord is uh, is declaring new identity over many of you here. And one of the things that happens when the Father's love touches our hearts is that He speaks true identity to us. He he reveals who He's made us to be. And for some of you, He's saying, you are my beloved. You've called yourself rejected. You've called yourself unloved, unwanted, unworthy, and maybe others have said that to you. But today, your heavenly Father, the one who spoke identity to Jesus, speaks to you. And He says, you are my beloved child, and I am so pleased with you. I just, I see Him peeling off labels that say rejected. And maybe if you're like, oh, wow, that's me. Just take a moment, grab it in the spirit as a prophetic act and be like, I'm taking off rejected. I'm taking off 
outsider. I'm taking off unwanted. I'm taking off lonely. Oh, and heavenly daddy, would you speak to me? Because he says you're beloved. He says you're chosen. He says you're right inside, close to his heart. I also feel that the Lord wants to um, just come and bring peace to people's hearts and minds. I feel like there are some people here who've been struggling with anxiety and you resonated with what I talked about. You're like, yeah, that's how I live. Wow. And so right now, if that's you, you just want to put your hand on your heart and I would love to pray for you. Father, I thank you for these precious ones. I thank you that you love them and you know them. And Father, where, where fear and anxiety has had a controlling grip on them, I thank you that you are inviting them into the journey of freedom, into the journey of peace. And right now I speak an impartation of peace to your heart in Jesus' name. Father, would you come with your great tender love and wrap around every shaky, anxious place and let your love begin to kick out fear. I just speak to all those racing thoughts right now um, in Jesus' name, and I say, be still. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Let me. Thank you so much, Sarah, for such a beautiful message and for sharing your your life and your story with us. And, you know, it's so good to hear something really personal because sometimes when you hear it from a live human being, it gives you and me faith to go further than where we're standing today. So thank you guys all for being here, for just coming forward and just being so open and willing in your hearts. I just, you know long to hear everybody's story and what God does and what happens. And so we're going to close this session just for your information. The auditorium, it's kind of cruel. We're not going to move you out immediately, but they do need to get in here and clean. So it's going to be closing in about 10 minutes, but it's beautiful outside. I want to just go outside and sit in the sun and just feel the presence of God out there today too. And um, after that, you can come back in at six o'clock. So Father, thank you for today. Thank you for going deep with us. Thank you for going far with us. Thank you for going persistent with us and never ever giving up on us. And we adore you for that. And we adore you for a thousand other different reasons. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.
Let me know when you want to switch to play back. You want to switch?